So now that we've talked about continuous distributions in general, let's now start talking about specific continuous distributions. If there is one continuous distribution that you should know, it is the normal distribution. And the normal distribution is often also called the Gaussian distribution after Karl Friedrich Gauss, who helped develop this as he developed techniques of regression that we will also talk about later. The normal distribution is related to many of the other distributions that we'll talk about in this class, and in fact, the normal distribution is often a special case of many of the distributions that we talk about when you choose parameters correctly or when your data get large enough. Just like we had parameters that defined our discrete distributions, we have parameters that define our continuous distributions, and in the case of the Gaussian distribution, we have a mean and a variance. These are the two parameters that define our distribution. And these distributions help give shape to our normal distribution, but the standard shape that you'll see of a normal distribution is what's called a bell curve. That is, it has high probability around the mean, and then it tapers out to the sides. And if you've seen any sort of distribution, it's probably this normal distribution. So here are examples of what a Gaussian distribution looks like for various parameter settings. And so in blue, you have a mean of zero and a very small variance. And so this means that most of your values are very close to the mean of zero. The red line is what's called the standard normal distribution. So if you have a zero mean and a variance of one, or unit variance, this is your standard normal. And so if someone says a normal distribution without telling you what the mean and variance are, it's safe to assume that they mean a zero mean and a variance of one. In gold, you have what's called a fat distribution, so a fat-tailed distribution, so a very large variance, it's very spread out, and this means that your data aren't particularly clustered around a mean, it's more spread out, more uniform-like. And then you can have different means, so for example, in green, you have a normal distribution that is shifted over considerably, and so it still has a relatively tight variance, but the mean is shifted over, so you have now values concentrated around that mean of negative two. So just like the other distributions, we want to be able to write down the density function in terms of some equation. And just as with the discrete distributions, the parameters play a role in the equation to tell us what values are probable and what values are less probable. So for the moment, let's not pay attention to the bit out in front with the pi and the sigma. This is called a normalization term, and basically ensures that this distribution integrates to one. So recall that all of the density functions have to sum to one, have to integrate to one. So this is just a term that does that. And so this doesn't depend on the value of x. This is basically just scaling the overall height of the function to make sure that it sums to one. Okay, let's pay attention to this part here. This is taking, for some value x, essentially how far away is it from the mean. If we just plotted this function itself here, what would that look like? Essentially what we're plotting is a parabola, and so it's small around zero and big elsewhere. And so if we take a minus of a parabola, we get a function that looks like this. And so this is kind of the shape of the Gaussian distribution that we saw earlier. But a parabola flipped upside down can take on negative values, and a probability distribution cannot go negative. We take x minus mu squared, and we put it inside the exponential function. And so this value here is always positive. And so if you take the minus sign of something that's always positive, that will give you something that's always negative. And so now, when you take the exponential, so when you put that all together, you now get something that has the overall bell shape that you want. 
So thus far, we haven't paid attention to this term down here. So this is the variance term. So the mean shifts the parabola left and right, and sigma spreads it out. You have a very small sigma, and you're dividing something by a small number. That makes it larger. And so that means as you get further away from the mean, the smaller this argument to the exponential function is getting, and thus the smaller your overall probability is. But if this is a very large number, if sigma is very large, then you're taking this parabola and you're spreading it out so that the individual values matter less. And so now you have a more spread out distribution. So one thing that you'll notice is that this is symmetric about mu. So as you move to the left of mu or move to the right of mu, you get the same thing. And that's because you have this x minus mu term squared. And so a parabola is symmetric. It looks the same on both sides. And so as you move to the left, move to the right, it looks exactly the same. As a result, the expected value of this distribution is mu. You have exactly as much probability to the left as to the right. And so if you try to compute the expected value, it will be exactly mu. And that's true no matter what your variance is. The variance just spreads the probability mass out on either side, so it still balances. So one thing that people often ask about a normal distribution is what is the probability that you will have an observation within some distance of the mean? Oftentimes, this is phrased in terms of a quantity known as the standard deviation. And so this comes from psychology and psychometrics, and the standard deviation is essentially the square root of the variance. And that's why we write the variance as sigma squared. So the variance is sigma squared, and sigma by itself is the standard deviation. So you can work out the math and compute an integral. But nobody does that, not even people who like taking integrals. What they do instead is they look it up on a chart, or they plug it into their favorite programming language. And so you can read off the probability of landing in particular ranges. And so here is a chart that shows the standard normal distribution, the probability of getting a value less than or equal to 0 is 0.5 which makes sense because it's balanced left and right. If you're at one standard deviation, the probability of getting a value anywhere to the left of one standard deviation of, above the mean is 84.1. And the probability of getting anything one standard deviation below the mean is 15.9. If you wanted to compute the probability of landing exactly one standard deviation within the mean, you could take this, subtract out this, and then you would get a percentage in the 60s, and thus a probability of around 0.6. But as I said before, you would almost certainly use a programming language to compute these values, not doing it by hand. The normal distribution is so widely used because it approximates many things that we see in the real world. For example, if you give a bunch of students a measuring tape and you ask them to measure how long the room is, uh, you will get measurements that are very close to a normal distribution. This is because measurement error has the property that we saw in the bell-shaped curve, that most people will be very close to the right answer, whatever it is. and the probability of getting a very, very wrong answer is relatively low. Many biological characteristics follow a normal distribution as well. There is something that is close to normal height, uh, particularly for men or women. And if you plot a single gender at a particular age, say adulthood, you will get something that looks a lot like a normal distribution because there is a quote-unquote normal height, and people will cluster around that height. And oftentimes, when you're taking a course, you will see something that looks a lot like a normal distribution if you give an exam. And that's because most people in a class know the same thing if they've been paying attention. And so when professors talk about curving a course, 
they try to fit those cores onto a normal distribution and, say, assign grades to that. And so even though we see the normal distribution in many cases in the real world, you can also do things to make sure that you have a random variable that is distributed according to a normal distribution. So there is a tool for mathematics that says that if you take a bunch of observations from some probabilistic process, some distribution, and then you average them, that will always be a normal distribution as you increase the number of samples from that distribution. Thus far, we've been talking about normal distributions of a single variable. So you have height drawn from a normal distribution, but you may want to model multiple characteristics as coming from a normal distribution. Instead of drawing a single scalar from a normal distribution, you'll want to draw a vector, and you can model that as well. And so if you move into two dimensions, you can have a normal distribution for both of those dimensions. And this is called a multivariate distribution. And so as you move out into multiple dimensions, it stops looking like a bell curve, and it now looks like an actual bell in three-dimensional space. If, say, you have two dimensions and the probability is your third dimension, the height also looks like a bell. So you have a lot of mass near the mean. The mean is now a vector, and so the vector in this case is 0, 0. And so you have the mean of the distribution here, and as you get further away, the probability mass dies off. Unfortunately, the math gets a little bit more complicated, so we won't be using a lot of multivariate distributions in this course. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we get to clustering applications, but uh, keep this in your mind that you can have normal distributions over multiple variables, and this gives you a little bit more flexibility, and you can, say, change the shape of your bell, that you can make the variance longer in one dimension and tighter in another dimension. If you have a bunch of observations and you believe they come from a normal distribution, how can you figure out what the mean of that distribution was? This is called estimation, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I wanted to give you this formula now so that you can use this to build intuitions about the normal distribution. So if you have a bunch of observations that you believe come from a normal distribution, you want to figure out what the mean was, the obvious thing to do is to take them all together and average them, and that turns out to be a good estimate of your mean. If you want to compute the variance, this is a little bit more tricky. So for the moment, we're going to assume we know what the true mean of the distribution is, and we're going to compute an estimate of the variance. So what you do is you take all of your observations, you subtract off the known mean, you square each of them, and then divide by the number of samples. So that has been our very brief introduction to the normal distribution. We'll be seeing a lot in this class, and we'll get into estimating more parameters of distributions later.